Humanity's future is frequently seen as a subject for unproductive discussion. However, our attitudes and presumptions about this matter influence the choices we make in both our private and public lives, choices that have very real and occasionally unfavorable outcomes. Therefore, it is crucial from a practical standpoint to work toward creating a realistic framework for futuristic discussion about the larger issues facing humanity. This study provides a brief discussion of four families of future possibilities for mankind, including extinction, repeated collapse, plateau and post-humanity, as well as a review of some recent initiatives in this direction. The future of humanity is an inescapable topic. In a certain sense, the future of humanity includes everything that will ever affect a person, including your breakfast choice on Thursday and all the technological advancements that will be produced in the upcoming year. This makes it difficult to rationally consider the future of mankind to be a topic because it is too vast and diversified to be covered in a single essay, monograph, or even a 100-volume book series. It is abstracted into being a topic. We distance ourselves from specifics, brief fluctuations, and advances that only have a small impact on a small portion of our existence. The major underlying characteristics of the human condition are discussed in relation to how they may change or remain constant across time. What are the essential and significant aspects of the human condition? There can be a rational difference of opinion about this. However, some characteristics meet practically any requirement. For instance, whether and when Earth originated life will become extinct, whether it will colonize the galaxy, whether human biology will fundamentally change to make us post-human, whether machine intelligence will surpass biological intelligence, whether population size will explode, and whether quality of life will radically improve or deteriorate, are all crucial fundamental questions about the future of humanity. Less important issues, including methodology or specific technology estimates, are also important insofar as they shape our opinions on more important factors. The future of humanity has always been a theological subject. The ultimate fate of humanity and the end of the planet are topics covered in the teachings of all major faiths. Famous philosophers like Hegel, Kant, and Marx have all studied eschatological subjects. Science fiction literature has carried on the tradition in more recent times. The future has frequently acted as a backdrop for dramatic entertainment, morality stories, satire of societal trends, or ideological mobilization. It has also frequently served as a projection screen for our hopes and concerns. It is uncommon for the future of mankind to be treated seriously as a topic on which it is crucial to attempt to have factually accurate beliefs. Just as there is nothing wrong with daydreaming about fantastical nations filled by dragons and wizards, there is nothing wrong with taking advantage of the symbolic and literary affordances of an unknowable future. However, it is crucial to make the greatest effort we can to discern between the futuristic scenarios put forth for their symbolic meaning or entertainment value and conjectures meant to be judged on the basis of their literal reality. In this study, only the latter school of realistic futuristic thought will be taken into account. Making wise selections requires that we have reasonable expectations about what the future may hold. We increasingly require accurate depictions of both our immediate local and personal futures as well as more distant global futures. Now that we have more access to technology, some human behaviors have a big global impact. There are numerous organizations and people that either do consider, claim to consider, or ought to consider potential long-term global repercussions of their actions as a result of the expansion of human social organization on a larger scale. This has led to new chances for cooperation and action. Examples of policy issues with long-time horizons include climate change, national and international security, economic development, nuclear waste disposal, biodiversity, natural resource conservation, population policy, and support for scientific and technological research. Arguments in these fields frequently rest on unstated beliefs about how mankind will develop in the future. It could be feasible to approach some of the major issues facing humanity in a more well-informed and considerate manner by making these assumptions apparent and subjecting them to critical investigation. It does not follow that we can have realistic images of the future just because we need them. Because predictions about upcoming social and technological advancements are so infamously incorrect, some have suggested that we stop using predictions completely when making plans and preparing for the future. The extreme notion that we can or should do away with prediction altogether is erroneous, 
despite the fact that the methodological issues with such forecasting are undoubtedly extremely serious. To give one example, Michael Crow and Daniel Sarowitz recently published a paper on the societal effects of nanotechnology in which they claim that the question of predictability is irrelevant and express this viewpoint. It is obvious that accurate prediction is not necessary for future preparation, rather, it calls for a solid knowledge base on which to base decisions, the ability to learn from past mistakes, close attention to what is happening in the present, and strong, resilient institutions that can quickly respond to or adapt to change. Be aware that every aspect Pro and Sarowitz list as essential for planning for the future depends in some way on accurate forecasting. Unless we can confidently assume or forecast that the lessons we learn from the past will be applicable to future circumstances, having the ability to learn from experience is not helpful for planning for the future. It is therefore pointless to pay close attention to the present unless we can presume that it will disclose steady tendencies or else provide insight into what is likely to happen next. Finding out what form of institution will show to be strong, adaptable, and successful in responding to future changes also involves non-trivial prediction. In actuality, predictability varies in terms of reliability and precision, and certain aspects of the future are foreseeable to variable degrees. Creating adaptable plans and pursuing policies that are strong under a variety of circumstances may frequently be wise decisions. In some circumstances, it also makes sense to take a reactive position that focuses on swiftly responding to shifting conditions rather than following any specific agenda or in-depth long-term plan. These coping mechanisms, however, only make up a portion of the solution. The accuracy of our views about the future, especially conditional predictions of the type of X is done, Y will happen, is another area that needs improvement. We can be moving in the direction of traps that we can only avoid by having foresight. There are other possibilities that, if we could identify them earlier, we could seize much more quickly. Prediction is always required for sound decision making, to put it strictly. With increasing temporal distance, predictability does not always decrease. A traveler's location may be highly unexpected one hour into her trip, yet it is foreseeable that five hours later she will have arrived at her destination. Given that it is a topic that the natural sciences, especially cosmology and physical eschatology, are able to explore, the very long-term future of humanity may be rather simple to predict. Furthermore, it is not required to be able to pinpoint one particular situation as what will absolutely occur in order for there to be some degree of predictability. There is also a degree of predictability if at least one event can be ruled out. Even without this, there is still some predictability if there is a basis for differentiating between propositions about logically possible future events in terms of degrees of credence or belief, or if there is a basis for criticizing some of these probability distributions as being less rationally justifiable or reasonable than others. And this unquestionably holds true for many elements of humanity's destiny. Although our knowledge is insufficient to condense the universe of potential outcomes to a single, broadly defined future for humanity, there are a number of pertinent arguments and factors that, taken together, place severe limitations on the possibilities for a realistic future. Humanity's future need not be a subject where all presumptions are completely arbitrary and anything goes. There is a huge difference between knowing exactly what will happen and having no idea all. Somewhere offshore in that gulf is where our true epistemic location is. Technology, growth, and directionality. Most of the contrasts between our lives and those of our hunter-gatherer ancestors may be traced back to technology, particularly if we define technology broadly to encompass not only tools and machines but also methods, institutions, and procedures. We could define technology in this broad sense as the totality of cultural information that is usable for instrumental purposes. In this perspective, technology includes things like double-entry accounting, tractors, machine guns, sorting algorithms, and Robert's Rules of Order. Long-term economic growth is mostly driven by technological innovation. The cumulative impacts of even moderate average annual growth are significant over very long time scales. Many of the secular trends in such fundamental aspects of the human condition as the size of the world's population, life expectancy, educational attainment, material standards of living, and the nature of work, communication, health care, war, and the effects of human activities on the environment are largely due to technological change. 
Technology also has many direct and indirect effects on other facets of society and our personal life, such as governance, entertainment, interpersonal relationships, and our conceptions of morality, mind, matter, and our own human nature. One need not subscribe to a rigid version of technological determinism to understand that the rules by which the games of human civilization are played out are greatly influenced by technology capabilities and its intricate relationships with people, institutions, cultures, and the environment. This perspective on technology's critical role in society is compatible with the wide differences and swings in technology deployment across different eras and regions of the globe. The viewpoint is also congruent with the idea that technology advancement depends on supporting sociocultural, economic, or individualistic variables. The viewpoint is also in line with the denial of any strong inevitability of the specific growth pattern seen throughout human history. The time and location of the Industrial Revolution, for instance, could have been quite different in a rerun of human history. Alternatively, there might not have been an Industrial Revolution at all, but rather, say, a slow and continuous drip of invention. One may even argue that there are crucial turning times in the history of technology where history could go in either direction and produce quite different technological systems. Nevertheless, if technological growth proceeds broadly, one may anticipate that throughout time, the majority of critical fundamental talents that might be attained through some sort of technology will actually be attained through technology. This concept could be expressed more forcefully as follows. Conjecture about technological completion If attempts to advance science and technology do not successfully come to an end, then all significant fundamental capabilities that might be attained through some potential technology will be realized. The hypothesis is not a tautology. It would be untrue if there were some fundamental capability that, while technically feasible in the sense of being consistent with physical laws and material limits, would yet be out of reach even after an endlessly prolonged development effort. Another way the supposition could be incorrect is if it turns out that some crucial capability can only be attained through a hypothetical technology that, despite ongoing efforts to advance science and technology, will never actually be created. The conjecture represents the view that the fundamental talents that are eventually obtained are independent of the current directions of scientific and technological study. The principle maintains that as long as our general techno-scientific enterprise continues, even the non-prioritized capabilities will eventually be obtained, either through some indirect technological route or when general advancements in instrumentation and understanding have made the originally neglected direct technological route so easy. The principle allows that we might attain some capabilities sooner if, for example, we direct research funding one way rather than another. However, it maintains that we will eventually develop even the non-prioritized capabilities. Without being convinced that the technological completion conjecture is absolutely true, one may find the general notion behind it to be tenable and in that case, one may investigate potential exceptions. Alternately, one can accept the hypothesis but think that its antecedent is wrong, i.e., that efforts to advance science and technology would eventually effectively come to an end before the project is finished. What are the ramifications, therefore, if the supposition and its antecedent are both true? What will happen if, over time, all of the critical fundamental skills that could be attained by some potential technology are really attained? The answer could be influenced by the sequence in which technologies are created, the social, legal, and cultural context in which they are used, the decisions made by people and institutions, and other elements, such as random occurrences. A basic capabilities acquisition does not guarantee its usage in any specific manner or even that it will be employed at all. It can be challenging to forecast how these elements would affect possible fundamental capabilities usage and effects. Which significant fundamental abilities will finally be obtained is perhaps something that can be predicted more clearly. Because if the technological completion conjecture and its antecedent are correct, all capabilities that could be attained by a potential technology will eventually be included. We can show that these expected prospective technologies would offer a wide range of new significant basic capabilities, even though we may not be able to predict all possible technologies, including some that are currently infeasible. Through what Eric Drexler refers to as theoretical applied science, it is possible to predict potential future technologies. 
Theoretical applied science investigates the characteristics of hypothetical physical systems, including those that are not yet realizable, by use of computer simulation and derivation from known physical principles. Theoretical applied science is likely the best tool we have for answering such concerns, even while it won't always provide a clear-cut yes or no response to queries regarding the viability of any possible technology. Therefore, theoretical applied science is a crucial methodological instrument for considering the future of technology and, a fortiori, one of the most important factors affecting the future of mankind. This holds true for both its more rigorous and its more speculative uses. It could be alluring to call the development of technological capabilities progress. However, this term has evaluative overtones, suggesting that things are improving, and it is far from being true that advancements in technology lead to improved outcomes. Even if actual research shows that there have undoubtedly been significant outliers to this correlation in the past, we shouldn't assume unquestioningly that it will always hold. Therefore, it is preferable to refer to the historical pattern of building up technological competence with a more neutral word, such as technological development. The advancement of technology has given human history a sense of direction. From generation to generation, information that is instrumentally useful has a tendency to accumulate, so each new generation has started from a unique and technologically more sophisticated starting point than its predecessor. It is possible to identify locations that, over extended periods of time, have stagnated or even deteriorated as exceptions to this tendency. But when we consider human history from a modern perspective, the macro pattern is obvious. It wasn't always that way. For the most of human history, technological advancement was so sluggish as to be unnoticeable. When technological advancement was that slow, the difference between technological levels over a significant amount of time was the only way to identify it. However, until relatively recently, the information required for such comparisons, thorough historical accounts, archaeological excavations with carbon dating, etc. was not available, as Robert Heilbrunner explains, dynastic dreams and visions of victory or ruin were entertained at the very top of the first stratified societies, but there is no indication in the papyri and cuneiform tablets on which these hopes and fears were recorded that they even vaguely anticipated changes in the material circumstances of the great masses, or even of the ruling class itself. In Visions of the Future, Heilbrunner argues for the audacious claim that, from the emergence of Homo sapiens, human visions of the future have gone through precisely three phases. With very few exceptions, the material, technological, and economic conditions of the world were thought to remain unchanged in the first phase, which spans the entirety of human prehistory and the majority of history. The second phase, roughly spanning the first half of the 18th century to the second half of the 20th, saw a change in worldly expectations in the industrialized world with the acceptance of the idea that the previously uncontrollable forces of nature could be subdued with the application of science and reason, and the future took on a great allure. The third phase, which is largely post-war but overlaps with the second phase, has a more conflicted outlook on the future. It portrays it as being controlled by impersonal forces and as both disruptive, dangerous and promising. The question of whether the discovered directionality was a global feature or only a local pattern would have remained if some keen observer in the past had noted some instance of directionality, whether it be a technological, cultural or social trend. For instance, there may be lengthy periods of steadily accumulating technological advancement or other causes in a cyclical perspective of history. There is a distinct directionality within a period, but each flood of expansion is followed by an ebb of decay, bringing things back to where they were at the start of the cycle. Strong local directionality is therefore consistent with the idea that history is essentially circular on a global scale. A type of eternal recurrence would occur if it were expected that the periodicity would last eternally. It may be difficult for modern Westerners to understand how natural the cyclical perspective of history previously looked because they are used to seeing history as a directional pattern of progress. Any closed system with a finite set of possible states must either settle into a single state and never leave it, or cycle back through the states it has already experienced. In other words, a closed finite state system has to either stop repeating itself or become stagnant. If we suppose that the system has existed for an infinite amount of time, then this probable result, that is, the system being stuck or cycling through previous states, must already have occurred. 
It may not be as important as it first appears that the system has a finite number of states because even a system with an infinite number of conceivable states may only have a finite number of perceptibly distinct states. Whether the current state of the world has already occurred an infinite number of times or whether an infinite number of states have previously occurred, each of which is simply subtly different from the present one, may not matter all that much for many practical reasons. In any case, the circumstance could be described as an endless recurrence, the most extreme instance of a cyclical history. Because the world had a beginning a certain amount of time ago, the cyclical notion is untrue in the real world. The human race has only been around for about 200,000 years, which is a pitiful amount of time for it to have encountered every scenario and combination that humans and their environment are capable of. The fact that the universe itself has only existed for a limited period of time serves as a more fundamental justification for why the cyclical approach is incorrect. An estimated 13.7 billion years ago, the Big Bang created the universe in a low entropy state. The entropic increase that is an inevitable part of the universe's history has its own directionality. The universe has advanced through a series of unique stages as entropy has increased. Several transitions took place during the dramatic first three seconds, including symmetry breaking, warming, and inflating. These were then followed, some 4.5 billion years ago, by nucleosynthesis, expansion, cooling, and the development of galaxies, stars, and planets, including Earth. The earliest fossils known to science date back to around 3.5 billion years, but there is some evidence that life may have existed as early as 3.7 billion years ago, if not earlier. It took a long time for more complicated species to evolve. Eukaryotic life took about 1.8 billion years to evolve from prokaryotes, and the first multicellular organisms didn't appear until 1.4 billion years later. From the start of the Cambrian epoch, around 542 million years ago, major developments started to occur more quickly, albeit they were still happening incredibly slowly by human standards. Some 2 million years ago, Homo habilis, our first human-like ancestors evolved, followed by Homo sapiens about 100,000 years later. The Fertile Crescent in the Middle East saw the start of the agricultural revolution, and the rest is history. Approximately 5 million people lived on Earth as hunter-gatherers 10,000 years ago, by the year 1, that number had increased to roughly 200 million, it reached 1 billion in 1835 AD, and as of today, there are over 6.6 .6 billion people in the world. Perceptive people in industrialized nations have seen tremendous technical progress during their lives since the Industrial Revolution. Putting away all the techno-hype, it's amazing how recent many of the things that define what we consider the modern human state are. If you shorten the timeline to the point where the Earth formed a year ago, Homo sapiens evolved less than 12 minutes later, agriculture was established a little more than a minute later, the Industrial Revolution happened a little less than 2 seconds later, the electronic computer was created a little less than 0.4 seconds later, and the internet appeared less than 0.1 seconds later. The vast majority of the universe is made up of ultra-high vacuum, and the minuscule material particles that do exist there are virtually all either too hot, too cold, too dense, or too diluted to support life in any form. Our position is unusual both spatially and chronologically. How should we organize our expectations of what will happen given the technocentric viewpoint used here our limited but significant understanding of human history and its place in the universe? In the remaining sections of this essay, four families of future human extinction, plateau, recurrent collapse, and post-humanity scenarios will be discussed. Extinction The human species will eventually vanish unless it genuinely lasts forever. In that situation, extinction is an easy way to sum up humanity's long-term outlook. Nearly all of the species that have ever existed on Earth, 99.9%, .9 have already gone extinct. The human species could go extinct in one of two ways, either by evolving into one or more new species or life forms that are sufficiently distinct from those that came before to no longer be considered Homo sapiens, or by simply dying out, with no meaningful replacement or continuation. Naturally, an altered continuation of the human species could eventually die off, and perhaps there will come a day when all life ends. As a result, scenarios involving the first type of extinction could eventually converge into those involving the second type of catastrophe, total annihilation. 
We reserve discussion of transformation scenarios for a later section and will not address the possibility that sentient life in the cosmos faces fundamental physical constraints here. This section focuses on the direct form of extinction, annihilation, that can occur over any very long time span that is not astronomically long, for example, during the next 100,000 years. Risks of human extinction have not gotten the scientific attention they merit. There have been perhaps three serious books and one significant study on this subject in recent years. In his book End of the World, Canadian philosopher John Leslie estimates that 30% of humans won't make it over the next five centuries. His estimate is based in part on the contentious doomsday argument and his own opinions on the argument's shortcomings. In his book Our Final Hour, Britain's astronomer Royal Sir Martin Rees expresses even greater pessimism, estimating that only 50% of people will live to see the 21st century. And famous American legal scholar named Richard Posner estimates the chance of extinction and catastrophe is substantial but does not provide a specific number. And in a study I wrote in 2002, I made the case that it would be foolish to give an existential catastrophe, with no temporal limit, a chance of less than 25%. Existential risk is different from extinction risk in concept. An existential catastrophe, as I defined it, is one that results in either the extermination of intelligent life that originated on Earth or the permanent and severe restriction of its potential for future beneficial evolution. The worrisome picture painted by these viewpoints can be the result of a publishing bias. Books on the subject may be more prevalent among academics who think there are serious challenges to human life, exaggerating the threat of extinction. However, it is interesting that there appears to be agreement among those experts who have given the issue substantial consideration that there is a significant danger that humanity's journey will end prematurely. The biggest threats to extinction, and existential dangers in general, come from human activities. For tens of thousands of years, our species has endured volcanic eruptions, meteoric impacts, and other natural disasters. It appears improbable that any of these historical hazards will eventually wipe us off. High-energy particle colliders, designer infections, and nuclear weapons are just a few of the unique phenomena that human civilization is introducing into the globe. The greatest existential dangers of this century are caused by anticipated technical advancements. The development of new viruses that combine the lethality of HIV with the spreadability and mutability of the influenza virus may be made possible by advances in biotechnology. The development of weapon systems with destructive power dwarfing both thermonuclear bombs and biological warfare agents may be made achievable by molecular nanotechnology. It's possible that highly intelligent machines may be created, and their actions will determine the fate of mankind and if it will exist at all. It is likely that there are still more existential threats to be found, given that many of the ones that currently seem to be among the most important were only recently imagined. We can reduce some dangers by using the same technology that present these risks. We can create better diagnostic tools, vaccinations and antiviral medications with the use of biotechnology. Molecular nanotechnology might provide even more potent preventative measures. Since a superintelligence, by definition, would be significantly more effective than a human brain in nearly all intellectual endeavors, including strategic thinking, scientific analysis, and technological creativity, superintelligent machines may be the last invention that humans will ever need to create. These potent technical skills would impact the human experience in many other ways in addition to producing and reducing hazards. Risks of extinction are a particularly serious collection of things that could go horribly wrong for humanity. There are numerous potential global catastrophes that would inflict significant harm on a global scale and maybe bring about the demise of contemporary civilization yet stop short of wiping out the human race. A global calamity that is unlikely to cause extinction may be an all-out nuclear conflict between the United States and Russia. Another example would be a terrible pandemic with high virulence and a 100% mortality rate among infected people. If some human populations could successfully quarantine themselves before being exposed, the extinction of humans could be prevented even if, for example, 95% or more of the world's population perished. Extinction differs from other existential catastrophes in that a recovery is not conceivable. From the perspective of humanity as a whole, a non-existential catastrophe leading to the collapse of world civilization is a possibly correctable setback, a massive massacre for man, a little error for humankind. 
A mere collapse of global civilization is fundamentally different from an existential disaster, but in terms of our moral and prudential views, perhaps we should just see them as incredibly horrible alternatives. But if civilization collapse becomes a part of a recurring trend, that may be a key aspect of the bigger picture for humanity. Recurrent collapse is the second family of possibilities that we now discuss. Recurrent collapse. Nuclear holocaust appears to have been replaced as the main specter haunting the public's imagination by environmental problems. Future pessimists of today frequently concentrate on the environmental issues the world's expanding population faces, fearing that our wasteful and polluting habits are unsustainable and will potentially destroy human civilization. Rachel Carson, whose book Silent Spring, 1962, raised the alarm about pesticides and synthetic chemicals that were being discharged into the environment with alleged catastrophic effects on animal and human health, is frequently credited with giving the environmental movement its early impetus. Over the decade, environmentalist gloom increased. As a result of population expansion and resource depletion, economic collapse and widespread starvation were projected to occur by the 1980s or 1990s in Paul Ehrlich's book Population Bomb and the Club of Rome report limits to growth, which sold 30 million copies. Global climate change has gained attention as an environmental problem in recent years. As carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases build up in the atmosphere, they are predicted to warm the planet's climate and thus raise sea levels. The most recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, which serves as the most reliable reflection of current scientific consensus, makes an attempt to estimate the rise in global mean temperature that might be anticipated by the end of this century under the supposition that no mitigation efforts are made. The final estimate is subject to uncertainty due to unknowns around the climate sensitivity value, the default rate of greenhouse gas emissions during the century, and various other variables. As a result, the IPCC presents its analysis in terms of six distinct climate scenarios based on various models and presumptions. The high model expects warming by plus 4.0 degrees Celsius, 2.4 degrees Celsius to 6.4 degrees Celsius, while the low model predicts warming by plus 1.8 degrees Celsius, uncertainty range 1.1 degrees Celsius to 2.9 degrees Celsius. These two most extreme scenarios, out of the six that were taken into consideration, are estimated to result in sea level rises of 18 to 38 centimeters and 26 to 59 centimeters, respectively. When looking at the situation from the perspective of the future of mankind, it is crucial to keep things in perspective even though this forecast may very well justify a variety of mitigating actions. Even the stern review on the economics of climate change, a report written for the British government that has drawn criticism for being overly pessimistic, predicts that global warming will reduce welfare by an amount corresponding to a permanent reduction in per capita consumption of between 5 and 20 percent under the assumption of business as usual with regard to emissions. This would be quite harmful in absolute terms. But over the 20th century, both the global GDP and the global GDP per person increased by almost 3,700% and 860%, respectively. It appears safe to state that whatever negative economic effects global warming has, they will be completely overshadowed by other factors that will affect economic growth rates in this century, barring a drastic redesign of our best present scientific models of the Earth's climate system. Scholars have made several attempts to explain societal collapse, either as a case study of a specific culture, like Gibbon's classic decline and fall of the Roman Empire, or as an effort to identify failure mechanisms that apply more generally. Joseph Tainter's Collapse of Complex Societies and Jared Diamond's more recent book Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed are two instances of the latter category. Tainter points out that in order for societies to maintain their populations, they must be able to secure resources like food, energy, and natural resources. Societies may become more complex as a result of their efforts to address the supply issue. This complexity may manifest itself, for instance, in the shape of infrastructure, social class distinction, military actions, and colonies. Tainter contends that societies that fail to scale down when their organizational overheads get too high eventually face collapse because the marginal returns on these investments in social complexity eventually turn unfavorable. According to Diamond, environmental issues like deforestation and habitat destruction, soil issues, water management issues, overfishing and hunting, 
the effects of introduced species, human population growth, and increased per capita impact of people have all contributed to many past cases of societal collapse. The buildup of harmful chemicals in the environment, energy shortages, the full use of the Earth's photosynthetic potential, and human-caused climate change are all new elements that he says could contribute to the collapse of both current and future societies. A detrimental outcome that occurs in small, almost imperceptible steps may be accepted or come about without resistance even though the same outcome, had it occurred in one abruptly, would have evoked a vigorous response. This is the danger of creeping normalcy, Diamond's term for the phenomenon of a slow trend being concealed within noisy fluctuations. Different sorts of social collapse scenarios need to be distinguished. First, there is the possibility of a purely local collapse, individual societies may fall apart, but if other highly developed societies survive and continue where the failed ones left off, this is unlikely to have a significant impact on humanity's future. There have never been any other occurrences of collapse in history. Second, we can hypothesize that the trend toward globalization and growing interconnectedness of various regions of the world, as well as new types of hazard, such as a nuclear holocaust or catastrophic changes in the global environment, create a vulnerability to human civilization as a whole. Consider the possibility of a global social breakdown. What follows is what? An existential catastrophe would result from a collapse of such a magnitude that a modern, advanced global civilization could never be reconstructed. It is challenging to imagine a credible collapse in which the human species survives but in which it is nevertheless impossible to re-establish civilization. What happens to this revived society, assuming that a new, technologically advanced civilization emerges in the end? Once more, there are two options. The new civilization might avoid collapsing, in the two parts that follow, we'll look at what might occur to such a resilient global society. Alternately, the new civilization disintegrates once more, and the cycle continues. We arrive at the kind of scenario that will be covered in the following parts if finally a sustainable civilization develops. We have the kind of scenario that was covered in the preceding section if one of the collapses results in extinction instead. The final scenario is that we are caught in an endless cycle of regeneration and collapse. Even while there are numerous plausible arguments for why a highly developed society can fall, only a small portion of these answers can logically explain an endless cycle of collapse and regeneration. The collapse regeneration pattern would be expected to be broken at some point when the right conditions finally allowed an advanced civilization to overcome the barriers to sustainability, so an explanation for such. A cycle could not rely on some contingent factor that would apply to only some advanced civilizations and not others, or to a factor that an advanced civilization would have a realistic chance of counteracting. Nevertheless, the alleged reason for the collapse could not possibly be so strong as to wipe off the human species. Therefore, a well-calibrated homeostatic mechanism that maintains civilization's level within a very small range is necessary for a recurring collapse scenario. Even if humanity were to spend many millennia on such an oscillating trajectory, one might anticipate that this phase would eventually come to an end, leading to either the eradication of humankind permanently, the rise of a stable, sustainable global civilization, or the transformation of the human condition into a new post-human condition. We'll now discuss the second of these scenarios, according to which the human state would eventually come to a standstill, either right away or after passing through one or more cycles of collapse regeneration. Plateau. There are two possible trajectories, one represents growth followed by a long-term plateau, and the other represents stagnation at or around the present level of conditions. The static perspective is improbable. Even in a period when change is exceedingly quick, it would suggest that we have only recently reached the pinnacle of human condition, what we do know, according to eminent technology historian Baklov Smeal is that during the course of the last six generations, our species has undergone the fastest and most significant transformation in its 5,000 years of documented existence. A radical departure with several well-established patterns would likewise be implied by the static viewpoint. By 2050, the world's economy will have increased by seven times its current level of wealth if it keeps growing at the same rate as it has over the previous 50 years. In 2050, the world population is expected to rise to slightly over 9 billion, which would result in a sharp rise in the average level of wealth. If we extrapolate any further, the globe would be about 50 times richer by the year 2100. 
Then, one small nation might possess the same level of riches as the entire world now. The global economy's time to double has been significantly shortened numerous times throughout human history, including during the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution. The world economy might be several orders of magnitude larger by the end of the century if another such transformation occurs in this century. The static approach has a low probability because we can anticipate a number of specific technology developments that will give people significant new abilities. Virtual reality settings will make up a larger and larger portion of our experience. The capabilities of recording, surveillance, biometric, and data mining technologies will advance, making it more and more possible to monitor people's movements, interactions, activities, and internal processes. One of the most significant perspective advancements is the ability to directly modify human biology via technology. Such interventions may have a more significant impact on us than changes to our beliefs, routines, cultures, or educational systems. Healthy lifespan could be significantly increased if we can learn to manage the metabolic mechanisms that lead to human senescence. A person with a 20-year age-specific old mortality would have a life expectancy of almost 1,000 years. If scientists could create risk-free and efficient ways to regulate the brain circuitry responsible for subjective well-being, the ancient but largely fruitless quest for happiness may succeed. Drugs and other neurotechnologies may make it easier for users to change their personalities, emotional characteristics, mental energies, love relationships, and moral character to become the kind of people they want to be. Our intellectual life might be deeper with cognitive improvements. The impact of nanotechnology on computers, medicine, and manufacturing will be extensive. Another potentially revolutionary technology is machine intelligence, which will be covered in more detail in the section after this one. Prediction markets and other institutional innovations may enhance human groups' capacity to foresee future events, while other institutional or technology advancements may pave the path for improved human organization. It is difficult to foresee how these and other technical advancements will change how people live their lives, but it seems safe to assume that they will. Those who doubt that advances like those mentioned above will take place should reflect on whether their doubts concern actual feasibility or are only concerns with timelines. The development of some of these technologies will be challenging. Does this make us believe they won't ever be developed? Not even 50 years from now? 200 years? 10,000 years? Looking back, the human state may be considered to have been greatly altered by advancements like language, agriculture, and possibly the Industrial Revolution. There are at least a thousand times as many of us now, and with a 67-year average life expectancy, we likely outlived our Pleistocene forebears by 3 to 1. Language, literacy, urbanization, the division of labor, industrialization, science, communications, transport, and media technologies have all had a profound impact on human thought. The second trajectory depicts possible futures in which technology advancement surpasses current levels greatly before leveling off below the point at which a major transformation of the human condition might take place. This trajectory avoids the implausibility of supposing that technological advancement has just recently hit a permanent level. However, it does predict that a permanent plateau will be attained at a relatively modest elevation above the present level. We must consider what might result in a plateau in technological advancement at that point. One theoretical idea is that natural principles restrict evolution beyond this point, making it impossible to advance farther. However, it seems that the physical principles of our world allow for organizational structures that would be considered post-human. Furthermore, it appears that there is no basic barrier to the advancement of technology that would enable the creation of such organizational structures. Therefore, physical impossibility is not a likely reason for why we should follow either of the suggested pathways. Another view is that, although a post-human situation is theoretically possible, it would be too challenging for humans to ever reach there. This explanation would only apply if the issue fit a certain description. The reasoning would at best imply that it will take a very long time to get there, not that we never will, if the difficulty simply involved the need to complete a huge number of technologically complex stages to arrive at the destination. It would seem that humans could ultimately solve the problem given enough time, provided the problem can be broken down into a series of independently achievable phases. 
It appears that technological complexity of this kind would prevent any of the trajectories from being a believable scenario for the future of humanity because at this moment we are not so worried about timelines. If technological complexity were to explain one of the trajectories, it would need to be of a kind that cannot be broken down into a large list of independently possible steps. The technological difficulties argument would be valid if all possible routes to a post-human condition needed technological talents that could only be developed by assembling components that could be independently verified and debugged or by building extremely complicated, error-intolerant systems. In normal accidents, Charles Perrault stated that attempts to make complex systems safer frequently backfire since the additional safety features bring additional complexity, which increases the likelihood that something will go wrong when parts and processes interact unexpectedly. For instance, adding more security guards to a location can enhance the insider danger, with a chance that at least one insider will be enlisted by potential attackers. In a similar vein, Jaron Lanier has stated that a complexity barrier has been encountered in software development. This kind of unofficial defense of the impossibility of molecular manufacturing has also been offered. These complexity hurdles defenses are all problematic. Furthermore, it is not enough to demonstrate that some technologies encounter insurmountable complexity barriers in order to offer an explanation for why humanity's technological advancement should plateau before a post-human situation is attained. Instead, it would need to be demonstrated that these obstacles will prevent the development of any post-human technologies, including biotechnology, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, etc. That seems like an implausible scenario. As an alternative, one could attempt to construct an argument based on complexity barriers for social organization in general as opposed to specific technologies, possibly something along the lines of Tainter's explanation of prior instances of societal collapse, stated in the previous section. However, the explanation would need to be changed to allow for stagnation and plateauing rather than collapse in order to obtain the trajectories. One issue with this theory is that it's not apparent whether the advancement of technologies necessary to achieve a post-human condition would necessitate a materially greater complexity of social organization than exists at the moment. A further explanation is that mankind can decide not to continue technological advancement past a certain point even if a post-human existence is theoretically and practically achievable. One could see the emergence of organizations, processes, or attitudes that, whether on purpose or by accident, would have the effect of preventing further progress. However, an explanation based on resistance to technological advancement would face various obstacles. First, how can a strong enough resistance to what currently seems to be an unstoppable process of scientific and technical advancement develop? Second, how is a global decision to give up progress accomplished? In a way that prevents any nation or underground movement from carrying on with technological research? Thirdly, how is the relinquishment policy kept in place even across timescales of tens of thousands of years and beyond? Out of the three already mentioned difficulties, a fourth one emerges, the explanation for how the resistance to technological advancement develops, how it spreads widely, and how it becomes permanent would have to avoid postulating causes that in and of themselves would usher in a post-human condition. One would have to question whether these interventions, or their ripple effects on society, culture, and politics, would not sufficiently alter the human condition. For instance, if the explanation postulated that powerful new mind control technologies would be deployed globally to change people's motivation, or that a comprehensive global surveillance system would be put in place and used to manipulate the direction of human development along a predetermined path. It is not contradictory to claim that some parts of the human condition will not change while yet arguing that stability and plateau are relatively unlikely scenarios. For instance, Francis Fukuyama stated in The End of History and The Last Man that the Cold War effectively marked the culmination of mankind's intellectual evolution. The final form of human government, according to Fukuyama, is Western liberal democracy. While it may take some time for this ideology to spread completely, secular free market democracy is expected to gain ground over the long haul. He adds a significant caveat to his earlier argument in his more recent book Our Post-Human Future, namely that the underpinnings of liberal democracy may be threatened by direct technological alteration of human nature. Whatever the case, the idea that liberal democracy, or any other type of political system, is the best type of governing system is consistent with the idea that the overall state of sentient Earth-originating life won't last indefinitely.
Post-humanity? It is past time to explain what has been called the post-human situation. The term is used to describe a condition in this essay that possesses at least one of the following features, a large portion of the population possesses cognitive abilities more than two standard deviations beyond the existing human maximum, life expectancy is greater than 500 years, and there are more than 1 trillion people on the planet. Most people have almost perfect control over their sensory input most of the time. The prevalence of human psychological pain is decreasing, any variation comparable in size or depth to one of the aforementioned. The rest of this work is at least as simplistic, so the ambiguity and arbitrariness of this definition may be pardoned. The explanation given above does not necessitate a direct alteration of human nature in contrast to certain other post-humanity explanations. This is because, whether brought about by biological advancement or other factors, the key idea for the current discussion is that of a level of technological or economic growth that would constitute a profound transformation in the human state. Vinji thought about a variety of ways that artificial intelligence, AI, and machines or computer networks, computer-human connections, and biological enhancement of natural human cognition can lead to superintelligence. The idea of a potent positive feedback loop, whereby improvements in intelligence increase our capacity to advance intelligence increasing technologies, is a key component of Goods and Vinci's arguments. Intelligence could be interpreted in this context as a general term for any mental faculties that are important for creating new technologies, such as inventiveness, work ethic, and the aptitude to craft an effective financing request. Singularity hypothesis detractors can argue that, whereas caterus paribus although it would seem that greater intelligence would result in faster technological advancement, there is another factor at work that could slow things down. This is because the easiest improvements will be made first, and after the low-hanging fruits have all been picked, each subsequent improvement will be more challenging and require more intellectual effort to achieve. Therefore, it is insufficient to say that an intelligence explosion would happen whenever intelligence reaches a certain critical magnitude just because there is positive feedback. To evaluate the singularity hypothesis, one must carefully investigate the kind of interventions that could increase intelligence as well as how difficultly piled these interventions are. A singularity would only occur if intellect growth could outpace the increase in difficulty level for each succeeding upgrade. Before running out of steam, the phase of fast intellect rise would also need to persist long enough to usher in the post-human era. If we concentrate on the potential for numeric rather than qualitative advances in intellect, it might be the simplest to evaluate the probability of an intelligence explosion. Uploading is a fascinating avenue to increased intelligence that illustrates this quantitative expansion and is one that Vinci did not touch on. The term uploading describes the technological process of transferring a human consciousness to a computer. The following actions would be necessary for this, create an accurate scan of a specific human brain first, potentially by feeding vitrified brain tissue into a slew of strong microscopes for robotic cutting and scanning. Second, combine this map with neurocomputational models of the various types of neurons contained in the network to recreate the three-dimensional neural network that implemented cognition in the original brain from this scanning data using automatic image processing. Third, use a powerful supercomputer to simulate the entire computing architecture or cluster. If the technique is successful, the original mind would be accurately recreated, complete with memory and personality, and would then reside as software on the computer. This mind might reside in a robotic body or in a virtual world. There is a trade-off between the strength of the scanning and simulation technologies and the level of neuroscience understanding when defining the requirements for uploading. More scientific knowledge would be required to make the technique work the worse the scan resolution and the less computational power available to simulate functionally possibly useless features. On the other hand, with sufficiently sophisticated scanning technology and computing power, it might be possible to brute force an upload even with only a basic understanding of how the brain functions, possibly at a level that only represents a marginal improvement over the state of the art at the time. One obvious result of uploading is the potential for several copies of one uploaded mind to be made. Computing power is the finite resource needed to store and operate the upload minds. The upload population could experience explosive growth if there is already sufficient computing hardware available or if it can be built quickly. 
The replication time of an upload need only be a fraction of the time it takes to make a copy of a large piece of software, perhaps minutes or hours, which is a vast improvement over biological human replication. And the upload replica would be a precise duplicate with all the abilities and knowledge of the original from birth. The availability of highly skilled labor could increase exponentially quickly as a result of this. Improvements in the computing effectiveness of the algorithms employed to run the uploaded mines are anticipated to lead to further acceleration. Such advancements would enable the development of uploads that could think more quickly, possibly at speeds hundreds or millions of times faster than those of an organic brain. Therefore, if uploading is technically possible, a singularity scenario with an intelligence explosion and extremely quick change seems plausible based only on the likelihood of quantitative development in machine intelligence. The more difficult to measure possibility of qualitative advancements lends the singularity concept some additional support. In this research, the term post-human refers to a condition that would virtually certainly result from uploading, for example in terms of population number, sensory input control, and life expectancy. Since a human upload would not experience biological senescence, it could last forever and periodic backup copies may be made for extra protection. The increase in productivity resulting from the population growth would probably be quickly followed by more changes. The intelligence of uploads, other machine intelligences, and the remaining biological humans may all experience qualitative advancements as a result of these additional modifications. Ray Kurzweil, an inventor and futurist, has made a somewhat different case for the singularity concept. The singularity is near, his most recent book, is an update of his past works. Although it covers a wide range of relevant subjects regarding radical future technology potential, its main goal is to illustrate the rule of accelerating returns, which reveals itself in the form of exponential technological advancement. The trajectory of development in a number of fields, including as computing, communications, and biotechnology, is charted by Kurzweil. In each instance, he discovers a pattern like Moore's law for microchips, performance increases exponentially with a brief doubling period, usually a few years. Kurzweil predicts that a technological singularity will occur around the year 2045 by extrapolating these trend lines. Although Kurzweil emphasizes the importance of machine intelligence in his forecast, his singularity scenario differs from Vinci's in that it is more gradual, rather than an almost instantaneous total transformation brought on by runaway self-improving artificial intelligence, it is a steadily accelerating rate of general technological advancement. There are several ways to criticize Kurzweil's logic. Of course, one can question if current exponential tendencies will last for a further 40 years. Second, while it is feasible to pinpoint some technological sectors with rapid growth, like IT and biotech, there are numerous others with considerably slower development. One could argue that economic growth, which implicitly includes any technological advances that increase productivity and is weighted by their economic relevance, provides a better indicator of the overall pace of technological advancement than a hand-picked portfolio of popular technologies. In fact, since the Industrial Revolution, the global economy has likewise been expanding at a roughly exponential rate, though the period between doubling times is much longer, about 20 years. Third, if technological advancement is exponential, then the pace of advancement now must be far higher than it was in the distant past. But this is far from being certain. According to technology historian Václav Smil, the 1880s were the most innovative decade in human history. Smeal has stated that the previous six generations have experienced the most rapid and profound change in recorded history. The longer term. By changing the timescale over which they are predicted to occur, the four families of scenarios we have considered, extinction, repeated collapse, plateau and post-humanity, could be adjusted. The scenarios may already have had enough time to develop over the course of a few hundred or a few thousand years. Yet such a period pales in comparison to the age of the cosmos. Therefore, let's step back and think about the long-term possibilities for humanity. The first thing to note is that the likelihood that technological civilization will remain within the region we dub the human condition throughout decreases with the length of time scale we are discussing. By redrawing the prior diagrams with an extended scale on the two axes, we can visually demonstrate this idea. Perhaps the situation that is least impacted by expanding the time period under consideration is extinction. Humanity will not come back if it disappears. 
The overall likelihood of extinction rises monotonically with time. However, one may argue that the current century or the following few centuries will be a crucial time for humanity, and if we make it through it, the life expectancy of human civilization may rise dramatically. This viewpoint could be supported by a number of different arguments. For instance, one might think that superintelligence will be developed within a few centuries and that, despite the serious risks associated with its development, the new civilization would have a much better chance of surviving because it would be guided by superintelligent foresight and planning once the risks associated with its development and its immediate aftermath have been overcome. Additionally, one would think that self-sustaining space colonies could have been founded in that time frame and that the probability of extinction would decrease if a human or post-human civilization spread out across several planets and solar systems. One might also think that many of the potentially transformative technologies, not only superintelligence, will be created in the next several hundred years, and that if they were going to usher in an apocalypse of existential proportions, they would have done so by then.